Hi, my name is Stephanie. I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar today, Service Catalog versus Service Portfolio. Our event is being recorded today. You will receive an email from me with a link to the event recording as well as a link to download all the slides that you see today. And I do hope to get that out to you no later than Monday morning. A uh, couple housekeeping notes. As I mentioned earlier, if you were on earlier, your lines are muted today. To ask questions at any time, please use the Q&A panel. You can access this up in the tight, excuse me, top right-hand corner of your screen using the blue icon with the question mark in it. One last thing, during the demo session, you might find it helpful to take the slides to the full screen mode, and to do this, use the plus sign or the double arrows located just above the right-hand corner of the slide that you're seeing now. So they're just above uh, and to the right of the evergreen logo. So uh, without further delay, I'm going to turn it over to Don Casson, CEO of Evergreen Systems. Don? Thank you, Stephanie. Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us. As Stephanie said, I'm Don Casson, CEO of Evergreen, and with me is Jeff Benedict, who heads up Evergreen's ITS in practice and is a terrific solutions architect as well. <clears throat> if you're new to our webinar series, welcome. If you're a past attendee, thanks for joining us again. Our goal is to share valuable information and insights you can use in your planning and activities right now. The topic we'll explore today is service catalog versus service portfolio. Here's our agenda. After a very little bit about Evergreen, we'll dive into the topic. We'll show how a service taxonomy helps and review a three-phase customer-centric roadmap example. Beyond that, we'll briefly demonstrate a service taxonomy tool and our always evolving view of an advanced self-service experience built on ServiceNow. Then we'll answer questions if you have any, and any time during the webinar, you may submit a question as Stephanie described. Evergreen is a US-based consulting firm and we work with hundreds of mid-market and Fortune 1000 companies to improve their IT service management execution. We're a full life cycle firm, or in the words of one customer, you have both process and technology in one company. We are one of the top five US ServiceNow partners and have over a decade of domain experience in each area of the ServiceNow portfolio. But we view all of this from a perspective of what we call customer-centric IT service management. At Evergreen, we think conventional ITSM wisdom is wrong. For the most part, ITSM has been done the same way for the, for the past decade. Incident, problem, change, and a little knowledge. At the end of it, we may be running a little better, but so what? What about the customer? Are we really making a difference for them? Are we delivering them any more value? Or are we waiting to phase two or three to even think about them? This old model is broken. If you're considering moving to ServiceNow as a new customer, or any other platform for that matter, demand more. You need to start with the customer in phase one. You absolutely can deliver a big customer experience improvement in phase one. One, the customers and the CIO will notice. And if you're already a couple of years into your latest ITSM journey, even more importantly, now is the time. For the past two years at Evergreen, we have been working very hard on exactly this, focusing from the customer in, not IT out. We see both the customer and IT's experience evolving hand in hand from the beginning, not as an afterthought. Let me share a short story with you. Late November 2014, we were contacted by a prospective new client who had been using ServiceNow for two years with little to show for it. She wanted to dramatically change her employee's IT experience by year end. On New Year's Eve, she went live with a beautiful new employee, Self Service Portal and told us it was the most impactful IT project of the year. She should know she's the CIO. All right, let's get rolling. <clears throat> so we'll start with the definition, what is a service? The service is an outcome that meets a customer's needs well enough to justify the purchase price. What is the purchase price? Well, it's not just money, as you know. It's the total investment the customer has to make to get the service, time, energy, and money. It also considers ease of use, quality, and complexity as the customer moves through the process, just like you do when you're the customer. This is very simple. The service catalog is your active storefront. It is the services you offer to your customers today. That's it. 
Let's dig a little deeper, though, into what makes up a good service. The goal is to provide a simple but complete description of the service and its attributes so the customer can make a self-service determination. Let's say I'm the customer. Here we have a service we call SAP Financials, which includes the financial software from SAP. We have a description of the core functionality offered so I can decide if that is what I'm looking for. Perhaps there are different user roles who see different functionality, for example, from a lightweight user role to a heavy duty use kind of role. I can see by looking at this that James Vitolo is the service owner if I need to contact someone about this. And I can also see that it's rated four out of five stars for quality. If I want to, I can click on the request this service button in the upper right hand side. And now I see a, a, a further brief description the approval process, the time to deliver, three days, and the cost to me, $50 per month if I want to subscribe to this. If the service catalog is our current storefront of active offerings to our customers, the service portfolio is the process that proactively manages the full life cycle of a service, from cradle to grave. It is helpful to think of the service portfolio as a factory that we want to build and run. We want to use it to manage services over their useful lives. Let's look at the flow of work in our factory. At the front end, we have consider, which is our demand or intake funnel. If you're successful, as you start to go down this path, it's quite possible that you will get more requests for new services than you can deliver on. Which are most important? Which have the greatest value to the company? How do we communicate this fairly to the customers asking for new services and how do we define value? Is it a balance of customer outcome, cost to create, complexity, and risk? You can see it's important to have a consistent basis for ranking and managing your new service requests. Next comes build, where we construct a service. Though it sounds strange, our goal should be not to build a service rather than build one. The more unique services we have for more and different customers, the more complex our service catalog becomes. This rising complexity can be dangerous and may make our catalog so difficult to understand and navigate that people stop using it. We want to follow a building block philosophy in constructing services. Start by creating a family of simple services which can be reused easily across IT and combine like building blocks to better create more complex services. An example here might be building a few standard approval models ranging from automatic approval, like in a standard change, to complex multi-step approvals that we then reuse. Next comes modify, where we update or make changes to a service during its useful life. This is fairly self-explanatory. What is important here, though, are the same questions we're asking in build, and making sure any modifications go through a quality assurance and change control process to ensure that we don't break existing functionality people are relying upon. Managing service building blocks as CIs or configuration items in a CMDB is a good service's best practice. Last, we have retire, where the service no longer has value and is removed from our active service catalog. An example of this might be, for some, a pager provisioning service. Perhaps you don't need that anymore. Interesting to note, while the service may be retired, it may be made up of a number of services building blocks that are actively in use across the enterprise. It is only this unique combination of these building blocks that is being retired. It is worthwhile to review your services on a regular plan basis, as having a lot of old, not very relevant services makes your catalog harder to navigate and makes it look out of date or not keeping up with the times to your customers. A lot of what we cover is pretty idle centric and many of our IT team members are likely not as well-versed in idle as we are. While none of our customers, who are also members of our team, have any idea what idle is. So it's helpful to have an analogy everyone can understand. Ford Motor Company is 112 years old. Do they operate in a service catalog and service portfolio manner? You bet they do. Here are three service catalog items you could select. Each one of these is a bundled offering, including the car, a warranty for repairs, and maybe even some prepaid services, like free oil changes for life. Here in the service bay, you find more service offerings. Perhaps the standard 30,000 mile service bundle, 
or perhaps it's a break job made up of parts, labor, and shop supplies. And here's the parts store, where you can buy accessories for your vehicle, and even these can be service bundles because they carry a warranty and may also be packaged with some labor to install an item. All of these things are presented to the customer in the Ford service catalog. If we go back to our service factory definitions, we have four steps. Consider, build, modify, and retire. At the front end of the demand funnel, the Ford product planning group considers what new autos should be developed for sale. And these possibilities compete with each other for funding just like your services do. Early on, when a new offering is being considered, designers create concept sketches to help visualize the possible new car. These concepts are often built into full-scale show cars, with some intended just to gauge customer reaction and help steer long-range design thinking. Others, however, are thinly veiled pre-production models that are near final design completion and getting ready to move into production. Here's a pretty far out Ford show car from 1958 called La Galaxy Concept. The future looked pretty cool in 1958, huh? Once the decision is made to build a concept, the full-size car, or I'm sorry, to go from concept to production, the full-size car is actually hand sculpted in clay by automobile sculptors, or maybe we would call them service designers. This is tool two today and is part of the build process. Also part of build, here we see a Ford Focus hatchback coming off a production line in Germany. Once we have completed the build process, we have a service item ready to be presented in our service catalog, or in Ford's case, cars start showing up in dealer showrooms. We move to the modify phase because cars, just like our services, are subject to changes over their useful lives. When a given model of a Ford Mustang, while, I'm sorry, while a given model of a Ford Mustang may have four to five year life, there's often a midlife refreshing or updating two to three years after the initial issue with a number of improvements. Here we see an optional modification to the service catalog item Ford Mustang, which is called a cold air intake. That's that big uh, pink looking funnel there. This can be added to the vehicle to improve performance. We're almost done. With, this, uh, with the Ford analogy. So last we come to the final phase of the service offering's life, retirement. <clears throat> Many of you will probably recognize this Edsel. This is when the service is taken out of the active service catalog, or in the case of Ford, the car goes out of production. Some services are better than others, just like some cars are better than others. Here we do see a famous failure, the Ford Edsel. It debuted in late 1957, and even with powerful marketing claims to the contrary, the Edsel look was only here to stay for another 12 months. So what is a service taxonomy? We already talked about a service, so we know what that is. A service taxonomy is a logical, repeatable way to classify the service that we want to offer, as well as the ones we might want to offer. The taxonomy of Homo sapiens here is a pretty good type of taxonomy model for IT services. The classification goes from very broad to specific, from millions to one, or perhaps few. The 140-year-old Dewey Decimal System is a good taxonomy example as well, and it's still in use today at over 200,000 libraries. Could you imagine trying to manage a library without it? So a taxonomy is a logical and extensible way of classifying things. Most, ta <clears throat> most taxonomies organize things into logical categories, groups, subgroups as the classification gets more and more specific. Taxonomies don't have to be hierarchical groups. They can be alphabetical listings of things as well. The best type of taxonomy for you is the type that is most useful in creating and managing the services you want to offer. It is very helpful if the taxonomy includes or carries with it the principles of classification in the framework. One common way to do this is to use self-defining terms, that is, terms that are generally understood to be the same thing by a high percentage of the target customer for that group of services. For example, the term high-powered desktop computer is more self-defining than compute hardware 64-bit Linux OS v5. The parts of a taxonomy are meant to be parts of a whole. 
At the highest level, the framework should capture the broadest view of what you see as potentially within the scope of your effort. Of course, the tax on enemy can be grown or shrunk later. It is never locked down. But it's easier to start with a broad view because there's no downside to it. You don't have to use all of it right away. And you will then minimize reclassification efforts downstream that could come from changing the taxonomy. So let's wrap the part of this part of the presentation with a high-level look at a generic three-phase customer-centric roadmap. This assumes core functionality like incident, problem, and change are already in place. We have classified the phases by color, and I hope you can make those out. I think you can. Blue being phase one, orange being phase two, and purple phase three. If you look at the blue line right down the middle, above the line is what the customer sees or experiences. Below the line is what IT sees and delivers from a service portfolio perspective. Remember, everyone is different. Everyone's roadmap is somewhat different. In phase one, you can create a beautiful customer self-service portal, accessible from any device, enabling the customer to log an incident, search knowledge, check status, and get help. If they don't see what they want, they can connect to the service desk with one click. For many organizations, this alone is a very big improvement. If you can go a little further, you can create your service taxonomy and bring a small number of high-value services to your catalog in phase one. This naturally leads to phase two, where it becomes more important to create your service portfolio process and begin storing your service building blocks in a CMDB while continuing to grow your service offerings. Phase three is when you circle back to service fulfillment up here on the upper right and focus intently on eliminating or automating the work of IT by linking it to the customer's self-service choices. We call that balanced design. At the same time, proactively manage, managing services health on the lower right-hand side from the customer's eyes becomes very important. So now this is, uh, I'm going to briefly demonstrate uh, a high-level service taxonomy tool that we've built. And this is, uh, this is fun for me because they don't let me drive much here. Uh, I rarely get to demo. So this is one that I'm actually capable of doing that for. So I'm going to shift over here. Uh, is that showing up well? Good. So many customers have asked us for a good general IT service taxonomy, and so we built it. As you can see, this is pretty broad at the highest level. Lots of non-IT services are here over on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, we have two categories of IT services. Building a taxonomy is generally a workshop activity with a lot of people involved. And having a visual workspace really helps to make it work. We've tried doing this in spreadsheets, and it really is confusing. They're just too big. We're using an inexpensive, easy-to-use mind mapping technology here called XMind. We've pre-built 70 to 80 percent of what we think you will need out of the box. This framework has over 500 components and is still growing. So if we go over here, let's look at IT. Like I said right away, there are two categories of IT services, customer-facing, and IT internal. This is a problem for a lot of service catalogs as these get mixed together, which confuses everyone. We've tried to help you prevent that from happening. So let's look at the customer facing IT services. <clears throat> as we open it up, you can see there are eight categories here to capture you know, the whole range of things we think are going to matter for this customer. And you'll note that we've tried to put these in terms that are very common sense, very plain English, that a non-IT person would understand. So if we look at a service desk and we open it up, we see the kind of things we normally would see in a service desk. And up here, we might take a look and say, oh, there's, there's a category called popular services. What might that be? Well, here's where we can get and do some interesting and creative things. We would tune up my PC, reset my password, what's new, or back me up. So there's a lot of things you can do when you get to this kind of a point. So now let's take a look at personal computing and mobility. We're trying to cover the range of things the employee would use in this category. Mobile, PCs, tablets, they'd have printers and accessories, software and apps. So we're trying to make it complete. We open up mobile. We've got iOS, we've got Android, and we've got mobile service providers here. We go down this a little further, we find we might have some mobile bundled services here. Maybe we've got a low and a medium and high price package. 
We also have BYOD, add, update, and remove. If we look at PCs, tablets, printers, and accessories, same thing is true. We're trying to cover everything that might be necessary or might be desirable. We open a desktop, we've got Windows, we've got Mac, and we may have a basic bundle, a medium bundle, and an advanced bundle. If we look at software and apps, again, three different areas that could be of value. There could be software installed locally, there could be software in the cloud, or mobile apps. So here are some of the titles locally that might be approved by the organization. Here are some cloud or SaaS providers that might be approved by the organization or available. And down here, we haven't done it, but we could add Apple and Android apps in the same light. Let's, take a, let's pop down here and take a look at the data center. There's a lot of things come that way. And we see at the very top, again, we've got bundled compute solutions. We're going to try to help our customers to get what they need with as little hassle as possible. Physical, virtual, and cloud could be arranged from low to medium to high. Maybe we've got a customer that's a little bit more advanced, like it could be a developer inside of a business unit. They're more IT-like. Perhaps they need to work at the server level. Or per perhaps they need to work at the storage level or even the database level. Maybe they want to use Amazon's DynamoDB. So let's go take a look down below, <clears throat> excuse me, at the IT internal services. <clears throat> Pardon me. Again, we have eight categories here, but they look a little bit different than the ones the customers saw. These are more IT language oriented. These are designed for IT people to use. So if we open up application and database services and we go a little bit further out here and we see the things we're doing in application, we get out to the far end <clears throat> and these are definitely people in IT, the kinds of activities they, they follow, right? the kinds of things they're doing to build the dev and release part of software. Then, like I said, we want to go pretty broadly and make sure we've covered a lot. As you can see, as we open up, in user computing mobility, there's a lot there. Same thing is true for communication and collaboration services. Pretty well detailed. And also for the data center and IT operation services. So let's say we've got a framework we like. How do we get it into our ITSM tool? Well, that's pretty easy. Using this technology, we can export it to a CSV file. And here it is. You can see it respects the levels we've established. It's our taxonomy. It's our categories. And as we scroll down, a little over 500 there today. So that is my part of the presentation today. I need to make this full screen. Will, no, I'm going to nope. move it over to Jeff. Okay, and I'll turn it over to Jeff now. Great, thanks, Don. Appreciate that. My pleasure. All right, so I'm going to start with kind of showing kind of where Don left off on the service taxonomy and also kind of this service catalog, the current offerings of service catalog. So where I'm at right now, I'm in kind of our um, our self-service portal that we've built on ServiceNow's content management system. And in here, the user can go to service catalog. And kind of where I land in here is starting in my service taxonomy where I can look through my different uh, kind of service categories and ultimately look at the different services that are provided to me as a consumer. And again, this is the, the customer view or the consumer view of the active service catalog. Um, and as a consumer, you know, some of the things that we're providing here is as a provider to the consumer is some transparency on what is the service, what can you expect from that service, right? And so some of my options as I go through this, I can look through and see those that are specifically tied to me or services I'm consuming. Either this is from my association to um, a, a group or a department, or me individually, uh, I've maybe been listed as a subscriber through the fulfillment activities, and we'll show that in a little bit too. Also, and Don mentioned this in, in the slides, that um, you know we have some element of providing feedback and rating these services, so I can also see these from a, a, a rating and top rating perspective as, a, as I browse and look through the different services. 
you know, obviously another common way I might look for them is through a search, um, and also another uh, common activity in here is using different nomenclature to find the services. So I might have a service called ERP, I might have a service called SAP, or I might actually abstract that and call it something like purchasing or financials. Um, but we're allowing for aliases or other kind of terms to be linked to and associated with these services to kind of ease that, that process of looking for and finding your different services. Um, let me go into one of these categories here real quick. Go back to service catalog, and then we'll go look at <coughs> finance, for example. So as I do this, I'm, I'm jumped into the various services provided within the finance category. This is the one that Don showed in the screenshot, so SAP Financials. So the information I'm seeing on this are, are the what's in scope, what's out of scope, um, what is the current health of this particular service, uh, as well as some of that feedback information. This is where I would go to actually rate and provide that feedback. Um, further, there may be knowledge information or other helpful articles that we can, we can provide to the consumer to help understand uh, how to interact with this particular service. And also, as we mentioned, we can also request and subscribe to this particular service. This throws me into my shopping experience where I can order or add to cart uh, my request to access SAP financials. Here. I think the last area I wanted to show is I mentioned service health um, in terms of looking at a given service and what is it, is it, what's its current, uh, uh, its current status, is it up, down, does it have planned maintenance, but this is more of a macro view of that service health, so I can come out to my service health dashboard, look at um, any current outages, alerts to the services that I consume, also I can look at planned maintenance, um, and kind of look at the health of the last five days of various services, so I can see something like EDI as a service has been down for the last five days, which may explain some of the, uh, I guess, reasons why my interactions with my vendor systems it hasn't been working as I would expect. So that's kind of the consumer view. Let me toggle here and kind of show you from more of a um, service owner perspective and the definition of a service. Um, so first of all, these various service records inside of ServiceNow um, <coughs> You know, is native functionality, though I will mention there are um, a couple of plugins that for those of you using ServiceNow, you may want to look at activating to support these kind of activities. Um, one is the Portfolio Management plugin, and the other one is the Portfolio Management SLA Commitments plugin. And what these do is they extend the CMDB to define these business services and their offerings and commitments that are being made. And then the second um, kind of plugin actually extends it to tie your commitments that you, you make to your customers to using the actual SLA definitions in ServiceNow to where you can actually track um, outages and availability information as well as kind of response and, and uh, delivery time. And I will mention that most of what I'll cover here you will find as uh, available kind of documentation on the wiki site in terms of how to create a service, how to create service offerings. Um, so there's a lot of public information on how to do this inside of ServiceNow. So let me show you a kind of a service record. So I've got <coughs> laptop support, for example. I'm going to go to kind of the detail here. So, you know, some of the things you're going to see is that we kind of showed from a consumer perspective, you'll see kind of now in an author or edit perspective, being able to define who owns the service, what's its current version, where is it in its life cycle, is it operational, is it kind of in a repair mode. Um, also, here's where our taxonomy linkage comes into play, where I can browse through my different tree you know, the same type of information that Don had in, in the mind map to be able to go and link this service to a given classification organization area. All right, and then also, if I go further down here, I'll see this is where I get to some of my service offerings and commitments as well as scope information. And so for, say, executive laptop support as an offering, I've got various commitments that I'm making that I can deliver and uh, adhere to. Um, also, here's where I'm tracking some of my subscription-related information. All right, so I think one thing I wanted to kind of cover here is, so we mentioned kind of the difference between service portfolio and service catalog, and really one of the main differences is the service catalog being the, the currently authored, current state of, uh, of services that are out there, whereas the service portfolio is the full life cycle, so the authoring of a new service, the retirement of a new service, so what I thought I would do here just to kind of show you through that process is kind of create a new service and ultimately 
promote it or publish it to a uh, to the service catalog as something that that users can actually consume. So let me start with I'm going to create a new service out here called <coughs> Yammer, which is a software product that we leverage for collaboration. So I can give it a name. Um, I can I'm going to actually make operational status non-operational because I'm not ready to release this into our um, our current service catalog, we're just kind of building this as a new service, right? I can also go and classify this, and I'm going to classify this under collaboration. Uh, just to speed this up a little bit, I do have some text I'm going to just paste into my description here, right? There's my description, and there's my new service definition item that I've got called Yammer. Just to kind of complete its, its profile a little bit, I will give it a, an image, just so it kind of looks good. And then now I can actually go out and create different offerings for this. Maybe I want to have an offering for kind of a gold subscription. Which maybe this costs 50 bucks a month. Right, and then in my gold subscription, I can kind of choose the various uh, commitments I'm going to make for this. Maybe I want to have some availability targets, 99.9 .9 or 99% availability. And I can also have maybe some response or resolution targets. Now, one thing to know with this, these commitments, as you can see, they're kind of a catalog or a library of various commitments. I can also author new commitments that are out there, but the idea is that you're going to have kind of a portfolio of, of things that you're going to make commitments to in terms of availability, response time, resolution time. And you can modularize that and kind of attach and, and, and slice and dice those and attach them to different, uh, different services. I'm going to create this one. This may take a second or two because one of the things that happens when you do this is ServiceNow is actually building out the, uh, the calculations associated with this offering uh, to give kind of the current state of, of availability tracking as well as how well we perform from a, resol or from a resolution target perspective. So I've got a gold package. Just to kind of complete this picture with a different offering, I'll create a silver package and maybe this one costs half that price. And I'll just insert this. And then I'll add a couple commitments here that maybe are a little lesser in value, maybe 98% availability, and maybe our resolution time is four hours versus one hour. All right, so you kind of see I've got a service now that has a couple different offerings and commitments. So this kind of provides that transparency to our customer. Here's what you can expect with this Yammer service and in different ways in which you can actually get service from this, either from a gold level or a silver level once this thing is done. <clears throat> so the next thing I want to kind of cover is being able to actually request this service and, uh, and, and also fulfill it and drive that fulfillment workflow. So one of the things I'm going to actually use is there is a, um, <clears throat> an application in service now called the Item Designer, which kind of helps me build a wizard for my request process. So in here I'm going to put a you know, request access to Yammer and make this part of our Standard service catalog, hide that, make this organized in the same place, and put this under collaboration, right? And I'm just going to kind of duplicate some information here, duplicate my image I want to display for requesting this, and ultimately I'll copy my other description here as well. Now what this is doing is providing a way for me to actually submit a, a request to gain access to, to Yammer. And I'll end up linking this to my actual service so you'll see they're kind of together. Now the benefit of using the item designer is I can kind of script both the information I'm going to get, any approval that have to happen, as well as the fulfillment task activities. So I'm going to add first of all a question here for the user to answer. That's going to be... I'm just going to give them a choice on what plan do you want. So I'm going to make this a select box. My question is plan, and maybe my default value is going to be that gold plan that we have. I'm going to make it mandatory, and I'm going to give them really two choices here, gold and silver. So we'll kind of be able to choose that as an input. And obviously, if I had other information I wanted to capture in order to fulfill this request, I could also ask additional questions. But I think from this perspective, I'm just going to ask that one question. I'm going to add an approval into here. So we have to get some authorization for this person to gain access to Yammer. I'm going to choose from the pre-approval and just say the requester's manager needs to approve uh, this particular request. Right, now lastly, I'm going to also put just a couple tasks in here. 
just to show you that we can have um, you know, some workflow kind of scripted and defined in here. So this is going to be, say, set up access to Yammer. Copy that. And then maybe one other task in here to maybe the service desk is going to provide instruction on use, on maybe say proper use of Yammer, i.e. no secure information shared, something like that. All right. <clears throat> So now I've actually got my item to define. Now, just to kind of show this point in terms of uh, this is a, a kind of draft service that hasn't been put into our service catalog for consumption, whereas if I were to come out here to our portal and kind of look for Yammer as a service to request, what I would find is it's not out there, right? <laughs> so the next step in this process is really to kind of promote this into a um, kind of a published or operational service. Now, one thing I'll mention with this is from an ITIL best practices perspective, services are considered um, <clears throat> kind of part of the configuration management system and therefore are governed by change management. So this would be a case where you would typically go through a change management process to uh, kind of promote that we are deploying this service into an operational status. And the same thing would happen with any material change to that particular service. You'd go through a change management. So I'm going to go ahead and publish this. And I got one more thing I'll do here, which is I'm going to go back to my <coughs> oops, uh, Yammer service. I'm going to link this item to my request for access. Let's save that. And lastly, I'm just going to flip my operational switch to say my service is now operational. So now when I come out to my catalog, and I'll just try doing this again, Yammer search. Well, there it is. <coughs> my service is now my active catalog. I can come and see my various offerings and commitments that are being made within those offerings. Same information, I can see the status, the feedback. And I can also go and request a service. Now notice also that the bottom here we have a newly added, so there's some highlights to the fact that there's something new that's been promoted into our service catalog that we can consume. Um, there's also a section for newly updated or newly uh, enhanced. <clears throat> so I'll go and request this. So here's where my question is about gold versus silver plan. And I'll go through kind of the steps here just to show you this, this workflow is in action. So maybe I need to collaborate. So I'll place my order, <clears throat> and here's my kind of request. So I'm going to look at this from a slightly different perspective. I'm going to go to my status screen. I'll see my new request for requesting access. You can see that it's <clears throat> now in a uh, approval state. It's awaiting approval. And if I were to kind of, let me just go show you this from the back end perspective. If I were to go into this item, you'll see that it's a waiting approval of Don Casson. Right, so I can go in just to kind of complete this process and show you the final steps of this. I'm going to go in and log in as Don. I'll prove this really quickly. So Don can come out to his portal. He can go out to things awaiting his approval. He can look at this and say, yeah, I'll give Jeff access to Yammer. Prove it. Right, and now I'll just kind of come back to me. I'll show you the last two steps of this process, the, the task part. So now we can see it's been approved. We've got two tasks, or we have one task here. First goes to the software team. So the software team goes and sets up the access, closes out the task. We'll see from that that now it goes to the service desk to provide that instruction once they complete that task. Then we'll show that our actual request is complete. And then lastly, if I were to come out to as the as the individual who requested this, I can come out to my status screen and I'll find that my Yammer request is no longer in my active list. I will be able to see that it's in my kind of closed and completed list and consider the details of those. And further, as part of this request access, <clears throat> I will now, if I look under my services, I should see service out here for Yammer that I'm a subscriber to with another highlight that says you are indeed a subscriber of this service. <clears throat> so 
So that kind of completes kind of the setup of a new service from, you know, kind of a, a definition perspective and then ultimately a promotion to the service catalog and kind of also showing you that there's a way in which to kind of capture that subscription and that request fulfillment uh, to that given service. The last thing I'd like to cover here, just a couple slides just to kind of summarize the points that I've made um, kind of in the demo. So there are a number of different pieces in ServiceNow to kind of manage these service items and, and elements. Um, and this slide kind of summarizes those data and those data relationships. Um, you know, so from a service taxonomy perspective, there's categories that are linked to these business services and there's as many levels of parent categories that you want to kind of build into there to kind of drive that organization. Um, further, any business service can have one to many different service offerings as well as any service offering can have one to many uh, commitments and subscriptions tied to that. And then lastly, you can link those to SLAs to actually track the performance on whether or not you're meeting those delivery time expectations, the response time expectations, as well as the availability expectations. I think last slide before we kind of move to next steps here is just uh, kind of some guidance on kind of approaching ServiceNow and defining the different items that I've kind of showed here. Um, we do kind of see one of the, a good first step is to kind of define all your business services in kind of a basic manner. Um, with some high level information and obviously then dig deeper into that in terms of what are the, the scope of these, what's in scope, what's out of scope, where, where applicable, break them into different service offerings, um, apply price and, um, you know, can these might ultimately be based off of showback, chargeback or something else, ultimately, uh, you know, make some commitments. And then also a lot of the services are going to be, especially some of the service health information is going to be dependent on other components within your CMDB. Uh, so relationships and relationships to your business services are often key to being able to make um, that true service health transparency happen in your environment. So that's kind of what I hope to cover today. Um, you know, hopefully that was helpful in terms of helping you uh, evaluate um, kind of service catalog and, and kind of the different options and things you can do within ServiceNow to support that. Thank you, Jeff. That, that's pretty cool, actually, because when, uh, when you go through that process and you build the subtasks on fulfillment, uh, it actually becomes a pointer to, as you've got active services in the catalog and you can look at the volume of those, then you can look at the, the <clears throat> fulfillment activities and say, oh, here's a, here's a candidate for automation, right? Or here's a candidate where we could leverage a few more steps in self-service and eliminate IT's work. So it almost becomes a pathfinder to your high-value fulfillment automation opportunities as well. Uh, that's pretty neat. So if you guys, uh, if you found this interesting and you wonder, you know, what might be a logical next step, here's a couple of options. Uh, if you're interested in the employee self-service portal that Jeff demonstrated, it is available as a self-service demo. You can get your own login on our website and, and play with it to your heart's content. You know, follow the front page banner on the website. It'll take you right there. If you're looking for a better way to organize and categorize your services like a taxonomy, you can access, uh, you know, you can access a data sheet and a short video demo of that taxonomy from our website. Uh, one other option would be perhaps you're considering, you know, a broader service catalog initiative, but you aren't sure where to start, how to get your team all on the same page. We do offer a one-day private service catalog workshop on site, which educates your team, uncovers the key business drivers, and creates a logical roadmap for going forward. You can literally save months of effort in consensus building and get your program moving a lot faster. And we do that for $3,950, which is, uh, you know, hardly covers the cost of travel, but it's a way for us to get engaged with you and help you guys get moving. So I think that's pretty much uh, what we've got to cover today, and we've got about uh, 15 minutes available still to the top of the hour to handle any questions that come in. Great. Okay, wonderful. So I do have some questions, and uh, just a reminder for all of you who join late, if you have questions, please use the Q&A panel. You can access this from the top right-hand corner of the WebEx screen. You'll see a blue box with a question mark in it. Click on that, please, and submit your question there. Uh, also, everyone attending today will receive an email from me no later than Monday morning with a link to access the recording of this event as well as download the slides that Don and uh, Jeff used today. So, uh, Don, I'm going to start with some questions I have that came in for you. Uh, the first one, why do you think focus on the customer experience has always been relegated to the end, to, to phase two or three? Okay. 
there's a, well, there's a couple reasons for that. While best practices are, are well known for incident, problem, and change by IT, we've been using those for a very long time, that's not the case for the customer experience and for the service catalog. So it tends to get put off because of the lack of that experience base. Also, you know, if you're doing a new IKSM footprint, you're replacing that core existing functionality, not extending it, it's usually top of mind in the platform change, right? You just want to get like for like or get that improvement achieved. Also, budget may be tight. And, you know, last, it could be that there, you know, there haven't been good employee self-service solutions out there in the marketplace. All that said, this can change now because none of those reasons are limiting us anymore. Great. Uh, another one for you, Don. You show fulfillment automation as a phase three activity in your roadmap. Is there any reason this can't be done sooner? Uh, no. That's, there's none whatsoever, actually, and that's, that's what we were talking about there after Jeff showed the demonstration of building the Yammer service and delegating the tasks out. It depends on the organization's maturity and bandwidth to tackle it, really. You know, with this roadmap, you can create a beautiful customer portal and still deliver the service the way you do it today as long as you meet the delivery expectations you've set. You know, if it takes two weeks to do it, set it at three. You know, just make sure that you deliver against the target you've established. Then in the background, you can begin automating and eliminating work service by service. And the only difference the customer will see is that a service that used to take two weeks is now done in two hours. Okay, great. Thanks, Don. Uh, Jeff, I think this one's probably for you. It's from Dimitri, and he asks, does this have an automated orchestrator mechanism to create a ticket or deploy a piece of software uh, like SCCM or similar systems? Yeah, and it kind of it kind of hits on I guess what Don kind of talked about. I mean, certainly behind the, the the request fulfillment, obviously I had the request for Yammer, and there were some you know tasks being orchestrated in those activities, but those could easily be. Uh, you know, you could think of those as being workflows that could or could, or, or could integrate to other systems. We have done uh, things like SCCM orchestration for, for other customers in the past um, and uh, have, you know, some success stories that we might even have out on our blogs or, or, or site to, to, to share. We can certainly share those with Dimitri directly, too, um, in terms of actually doing things like that, of orchestrating a software request and having it integrate into SCCM so that the delivery is kind of for one uh, insured, but also done as quickly as possible. Yeah, we have built that as a product we call the Enterprise Application Store, but that functionality allows you to link the user self-service activity with an automated, you know, with an automated provision capability, so they can they can literally be using the software within minutes, and no one in IT had to do a single thing. That's uh, for us. That we think that's the essence of a balanced design. We give the customer what they want and IT gets what it needs, which is the elimination of the work. Okay, great. Um, Don, well, this is probably for you and Jeff, and Randy's asking, and I'm sorry I'm getting pop-up windows here, uh, I have service now at my organization with problem and incident deployed. What are my options to use your portal for service management? Well, Jeff, why don't you answer that one? You better, I think it's better for you than I. Yeah, I mean, so certainly, uh, you know, putting a, a customer portal in place is, is, is still an option. We have customers that kind of start in different, different, uh, I guess, maturity levels on how they're using ServiceNow. You know, Don mentioned uh, the customer that uh, kind of needed to, to do, had been using ServiceNow for a couple of years and really hadn't made a lot of momentum and put a portal in place, you know, in a couple of weeks before the end of the year and really saw that as a transformative project for them. And, and really to begin with, they, they they were providing some visibility to things like incident status, providing some visibility into some of the knowledge and helpful articles that were commonly needed, um, but really weren't going too deep in terms of the actual request items and, and um, kind of the fulfillment or automation. So there's a lot of ways you can start with just kind of starting to provide a uh, new kind of face to IT to your customers. Um, even if your back-end, you know, IT processes haven't been, um, you know, if you haven't gone too deep with building out catalog or, or request items, there's still some value in creating that kind of new, new experience and engaging differently with your customers. Uh, in a lot of ways, we also kind of provide some coming soon or, you know, use it as a way to kind of, um, kind of cover the current use cases, the current needs, but also start to build momentum towards the, the, the future maturity that, that the 
uh, can be starting to be exposed to that to that portal. Yeah, and, and we, you know, Jeff, the, I don't know if you mentioned this, but the the functionality of the self service portal is built right in ServiceNow, and it, it comes as an update set. So it's not like it's uh, it's not a different set of code, it's not a different product, uh, and we do sell it on an annual license basis. Uh, with all the functionality you guys see, and it's our intent is to price it very reasonably, and it's uh, that that set is twelve thousand five hundred a year, regardless of the size of your footprint, and it's uh, our goal is to uh, you know to get engaged with people and help them move forward. So you you know the uh, to be able to do that right now, yes, if it's something you want to do, it's very doable. Okay, great. Uh, I've got a question from Tyler and Jeff. I think this is for you. And it's a little lengthy, so just bear with me for a minute here. Defining services. For example, email service ranges from 20 to 80 different applications based on the country in which email is used, i.e. Some, regula some regulators require additional security components in their country. Can the catalog be designed to address email service components by the country in which it will be used? So, uh, so I don't know if it's entirely for me, but certainly from a ServiceNow perspective, the, the, you can certainly define multiple different services and or, or break it up into multiple different service offerings depending on whether it's the, the you know, you can go either which way in terms of having the service be a location-based service or have the service offerings be kind of location-based flavors. Um, and there are a lot of examples out of the box with that, and, and, I, and I will say a lot of um, you know, the perspective we want to provide to the consumers are showing them services that are relevant to them. So that would be another element, too, in that we'd want to be able to classify who are the consumers within the, within the portal interacting with kind of the service catalog, and is there a way for us to, from who they are and their role within the organization, to only show them those services that are relevant to them. So obviously if somebody's in China and there's a specific email service for China, then we don't want to show them a North America one for that example. Don, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, all I would say is that we've done some advanced work in roles-based, like Jeff is talking about, and and probably the biggest limitation for most organizations is their roles, their roles, their roles-based data is not really very good or consistent, right? And without that, it becomes hard to do it that way. But we have advanced that functionality, and if somebody's got good control of roles, you can really change things. You can make it very different. Okay, great. Um, Randy had asked earlier about his options um, to use the portal for service management. He already has uh, problem, excuse me, problem and incident deployed, and he's got a follow-up question here about how long does it take? How long, on average, does it take to get the services up and running? Yeah, I mean, it can certainly vary. Um, you know, I think as far as deployment of, say, the customer portal to um, kind of on top of a ServiceNow environment, we're talking days for that to kind of install it, provide a new skin. Um, but it's, you know, oftentimes what we see in a lot of our engagements is customers want to do that, but then they also want to add in um, some new services to be requested and, um, and orchestrated through that kind of portal. And, you know, so, I mean, I guess the, the, the variability is in the complexity of that service and, and whether it's being orchestrated or whether it's being automated and, and kind of how we're going to fulfill that. But, um, you know, I would say kind of start small and try to build momentum and kind of iterate from there on out is typically the approach we try to follow. So kind of put in manageable chunks that we can kind of, you know, kind of get some quick wins and, and continue to build that momentum. Yeah, you can. I mean, you can literally make a dramatic difference inside a calendar month, you know. And it's and it's it's something that the CIO sits up and notices. I'll tell you. And I I can't tell you how many of these engagements where I've gone on with a client, and either the CIO is the one pushing the whole the whole project forward, or they hear about it and they become very interested and active. And it's I think it's about that desire to deliver a beautiful customer experience and and have a transformative view of IT. But that example I mentioned to you guys earlier on in the presentation is a true story. It was less than, you know, it was less than 30 days. It was by New Year's Eve that that completely transformative experience was in place. Uh, Jeff, a uh, question, a couple of questions for you. I'm going to read both of them. The first one is, does the portal work on mobile devices? And then the second question, how does your portal offering map out complex or multiple access form requirements? 
So the first question, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, so we, and I would uh, kind of encourage those to see some of our previous webinars. We did cover kind of the portal uh, framework in further detail, and obviously we'd encourage you to go out and uh, test drive uh, uh, the portal kind of through our, our access point as well and get a login and kind of look and play with it. But it is made fully responsive, so um, kind of three-factor responsive in the sense that there's uh, display on the tablets as well as display on the iPhones and, and, and Androids. Um, so it's been made. It's been made for that. That was one of the main purposes for kind of creating it to have a, a fully responsive, uh, you know, framework and portal solution. <coughs> um, you remind me, what was the second question on there? Uh, about multiple access. Hold on, I got to scroll back down. How does your portal offering map out complex multiple access form requirements? Yeah, so I mean, most of the way, I mean, so most of the portal that we were providing, obviously, is provide is providing a, a, a presentation layer to some of the uh, standard service now kind of service catalog capabilities to request things. So there are there are ways you can do um, complex request forms, like through order guides in ServiceNow. Um, we've also done, we mentioned kind of the, the software store, the application store. Um, in, in that kind of solution, we had some pretty complicated, um, uh, I, guess, uh, pre I guess, pretty elaborate uh, ways to capture multiple pieces of information of what the user needed to, to kind of fund and pay for. So there's, there's, there's techniques in service now to be able to either use order guides to kind of walk the user through that ordering process or to have things like UI macros in your um, kind of request items to capture kind of uh, the specific details of that request. And then ultimately on the back end, your workflows can be, uh, we see oftentimes uh, workflows to be modularized where you may have workflows calling other sub-workflows for different components and pieces of that, of that fulfillment activity. Um, I have a question for from Steve, and Steve, we uh, we can certainly follow up with you directly as well. Uh, Steve is curious what which uh, federal agencies we may have worked with recently, and also what is the pricing model if uh, we already own and use service now? So that's something you want to touch on now, and we can follow up directly afterwards. Um, I'm sorry, what was the second question? Uh, what is the pricing model if the agency already owns and uses service now? Okay. Um, yeah, the pricing model is essentially the same for this for this overlay for the update set for the ESS portal, and it goes right on top of your normal ITSM subscription. So there's no other additional cost for that. Uh, from a federal agency standpoint, we're actively involved at NASA today, and uh, we're involved with the uh, GSA from a portal perspective, from the Sergeant at Arms, the Senate and FDIC, and there's probably three or four others where we're, well, actually, uh, <laughs> at, DO, uh, at DOE and at NIST, I probably had NIST customers on the phone, I'm glad I thought of that, uh, Argonne National Labs, uh, Lawrence Livermore Labs, so it's a pretty good, it's a pretty good set of federal customers today. And uh, let's see, pricing model, you said it was the same. Okay, uh, bear with me, folks. I got a lot of last minute questions coming in. Just want to make sure I'm getting them all. Uh, Jeff, looks like I've got a couple more for you. Um, it was mentioned that change management should be used for making a service operational in the service catalog. Is a is a change needed for any service change? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think from an ITIL, you know, I'd say from an ITIL letter of the law perspective, the answer would be yes. Um, though I, I think any, you know, any, I guess any ITIL thing probably should be taken in the perspective of practicality and, um, you know, and I guess materiality. You know, we we oftentimes see, you know, that things like the the goal of change management ultimately is to, you know, mitigate the risk of, of any kind of change you make to your environment. Um, that we oftentimes find that uh, sometimes the, if the change that you're making is very low risk and it's sometimes not practical to go through a very, you know, bur bureaucratic change management workflow. Um, so I'd say in general you want to kind of evaluate the materiality of that change and the impact and risk it may have uh, and whether that, that, that'll provide the guidance whether you need to go through change management. You know, some, you know, for example, if we were just kind of clarifying some of our service description that is in a very immaterial manner, then it probably doesn't make a lot of sense to go through change management. But certainly a lot of the things that we did today, the introduction of a new service, you know, if I change the, the price or the delivery expectations or some of the offerings, then 
uh, it would probably be, you know, it would be prudent to, uh, to to go through change management to promote that, communicate that, et cetera. Yeah, well, I, we haven't done this, but I would imagine it would be possible to do it from a field standpoint in the actual service to say, hey, if there are changes to description, that's like a standard change, it's automatically approved. If, you know, field by field, I, you know, I'm spitballing here, Jeff, but I would imagine there might be the ability to show, you know, to lock that and then require an approval based upon the field itself. Yeah, yeah certainly, yes. Yeah, because we don't want it to make it very, you know, the service owner needs to keep the service current, right? It needs to be current, it needs to be correct. And so making it onerous to change it is fighting against that. So, yeah, I think it would be a variable approach. Okay, great. Uh, Jeff, another one for you. Uh, are there any specific ServiceNow licenses needed to support what you demoed today? Uh, no. So I kind of mentioned that there were a couple plugins that uh, you, you know, likely want to activate to get those extra tables, views, and the linkages to SLAs. But the things I covered were, were primarily in the um, kind of foundation set of ServiceNow, like configuration management, SLA. The content management system is all part of that foundation license. Um, so, I mean, I think the uh, the only thing that would be the assumption is that those who own ServiceNow have kind of a service automation suite license, which covers the, the service catalog and uh, the request fulfillment aspects of ServiceNow. Okay. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting a follow-up question about the pricing. Um, let's see. Uh, Paul's asking what was the cost. There was a question earlier about the cost if they have ServiceNow already installed versus if they don't. Did you give any price ranges or? Well, it's, uh, yeah, the cost of the uh, employee self-service portal is 12500 Okay. And that sits on top as an update set on, I assume it's going to be on the IPSM suite, which is what, I believe that's what it sits on, Jeff. But that's what most everyone has today. So you wouldn't have to buy, if you bought that portal, it would be very surprising if you would have to buy anything else software-wise to be able to do it. Uh, Jeff, I've got a question from Eric. Um, he said, are you using ServiceNow orchestration? So in the demo that we showed today, no, but we are using it for a number of our customers to, to do that automation of delivery. You know, in the example I had today, we were just basically using the item designer to create a couple of tasks on the back end of an approval, um, but you can use the workflow and the orchestration aspect of ServiceNow to kind of remove a human task and said, you know, do an integration to a system, uh, you know, call some scripts or PowerShell scripts and, and make some changes to Active Directory or integrate to another you know, product or so forth, um, that would be on the fulfillment activities. And we have done quite a bit of that work for other customers. And, you know, in certain use cases, things like onboarding and um, SCCM provisioning, we talked about that. You know, those are good use cases for doing the orchestration on that fulfillment activity. Okay. And Jeff, I've got one more for you, and then I'll check the boards one more time. Uh, what is the item designer application? Yeah, I wondered if someone would ask, because uh, so some, some of you that are using older versions of ServiceNow may not have seen this as a new, it's a new application that was added into Eureka, and you kind of got a, I guess, a brief, I guess, a, a touch in terms of what you can do with it, but uh, primarily it's a, it's a, it's an alter, it's another way of kind of defining the request fulfillment tied to a request item. Um, there are also, uh, in ServiceNow, there are things called execution plans, there's also things called, there's also a workflow a drive fulfillment, but uh, the item designer uh, was kind of built for the ability to have kind of a citizen developer to be able to go out there and say, here's the inputs that I need, here's the approvals that I need, as well as kind of the task sequencing. Uh, we tend to find that uh, when it comes to things like doing the orchestration or more elaborate workflows, that um, uh, then we tend to fall back to more of the workflow editor, workflow designer uh, over the item, the item designer. But for simplified workflows, it's a pretty common, helpful tool. Okay, great. Well, uh, we ran a couple minutes long. I don't see any other questions, so I do want to thank everyone once again for joining us. I will get an email out to you by Monday. You're always invited to visit the resources page.
at evergreensys.com for copies of our previous webinars and the slides that were used. So thank you again for joining us.